Hi, I'm Anna Thurgood and I'm, I'm here at State Library of Queensland. I curated the exhibition 20, Two Decades of Queensland Photography and you're tuning in to our curator's talks behind the lens and today I'm going behind the lens with Joanne Dreesens. Hi Jo, thanks for joining us. Hi Anna, thanks for having me. Um, so I'd just like to remind everyone that um, please feel free to leave your comments and feedback and any questions because Jo and I will be on the line to answer them as well. So first question, Jo, I've been asking all photographers this, um, but when or how did you first get into photography? So I grew up in Brisbane and I went to two high schools. The second high school thankfully saved me in um, the art space. So I started photography in the film and TV uh, classroom with a lady called uh, Janelle Christopherson, who now works at QPAC. And then um, started nighttime photography cl uh, classes with Doug Spower and his mother, Ruby. Mm -hmm. Just across the road from the museum upstairs, there was imagery gallery. Mm -hmm. So there's this beautiful like Brisbane connection and continued mentors that I'm in um, contact with. So, and then eventually, uh, yeah, mid nineties, I started my photography cadetship at the state library through a number of, you know, amazing career paths and mm -hmm. faith, I call it. Mm -hmm. So yeah. I've been very, very fortunate. Oh, that's, that's great. Um, so what sort of camera did you use back then when you first started out? Well, when I started the classes with Doug and Ruby, they were uh, suggesting the Pentax K1000. And I know a lot of colleges uh, also encouraged it at the time. And, it, you know, I'm from the analog era, so it's the film, uh, the best film student camera because it's, it feels really awesome. And so, you know, students drop them. It's pretty robust as well. Um, I still have it today. It's actually sitting right in front of me. And I just picked it up for the first time in ages. So thanks for prompting me to, I like to, you know, go back to the, the early, you know, the, the early pathway of skill sets, you know, the old school skill set and remembering those really um, awesome tools that have evolved. Yeah. So do you ever still, would you use that camera still? Uh, I would love to. I have got some film still from my library days, still, still mm -hmm. sitting in my office and I look at it quite a lot but um yeah I'm not sure what condition the film would be in but I would love to just I love that tangibleness of that era and physically putting in the the film closing it clicking it and then like literally when I picked it up the first thing I did was um just check to see whether there was a film in it before I opened up the back you know so <laughs> Yeah, but like, all those habits have really been embedded so yeah, yeah. like muscle memory you just ha you just do it automatically yeah um so just moving on i i've read that you were adopted when you were very young but you later were able to reconnect with your aboriginal family um are you able to tell us a little bit about that journey and, and if photography played any part in that yeah sure uh it, photography was actually crucial to me connecting with my family and um, and that's why I mentioned the term sort of faith or fate before, because uh, it, particularly in the South Brisbane area where I was, uh, can, you know, sort of drawn to a lot. So there's the Imagery Gallery, Queensland Museum, I'd spend a short amount of time at as well before the library. And then places like West End and Musgrove Park. Mm -hmm. So quite often, um, you know, I'd come across people who knew I was interested in photography. It was quite rare to be, you know, an Aboriginal person even having a camera and documenting things, um, but it was basically face value. So they would look at you and say, oh, you look like such and such. And then uh, having stepped into like the institution world, I started um, producing images of my ancestors by accident. So my mm -hmm. great grandparents, and then my great grandfather is uh, featured in the Tinder collection. Mm -hmm. And my great grandmother uh, was featured in the Queensland Museum ethno-historical collection. Mm. So I was handling those as images. Um, and then later I was in contact with people who work in the industry like Mark Laird, uh, mm. Vicky Turner at the time who was studying anthropology. Um, a little bit further on, Olivia Robinson came into that space at the Queensland Museum. And so we were working on um, the language book, which my grandmother, which I didn't know at the time was my grandmother and my auntie who they're both now passed. 
but they worked quite closely with Michael Laird to do his second publication under Kiera Press. And we did, um, he invited me into that space to work with him and even Mick Richards to document the stories around the loss of Aboriginal language in South East Queensland with a group of elders. And by chance, one of two of those elders, or actually there was a few more, but specifically my nana who uh, wanted to do this publication was my grandmother. So throughout that period of that project, Hero was helping, you know, and being shown how to document, you know, on site, you know, elders in their front yard or in the community. I go home and I'd spend time with my adopted mother, who was very supportive of my journey. And then she just rings up out of the blue and said, we've worked out that you're actually my granddaughter and we're very pleased about it. <laughs> and the rest is kind of history and it's, and it's been ongoing ever since. So that was 93, 94. Yeah. Well, that, that's amazing. That must have been, um, well, that's an amazing journey. And, it, and I guess such a completeness, you know, that a full circle sort of a thing. Absolutely. And, and I never, ever take it for granted. Sorry. Mm, no, yeah. That's amazing. So you've mentioned that um, you yourself were a staff member here at the State Library and you, you did your cadetship in those days um, and that you worked as a staff photographer amongst other roles here at the library. And I'm just wondering, what's it like? What's the life of a staff photographer at a big institution like the library? What's that like? Um, it was interesting because... Obviously, I, I was next door at the Queensland Museum at the time when um, actually Michael introduced me to Rainer, Rainer Irma, the then photographer. And it was literally a really informal lunch, hello. And she was like, oh, I'm looking for another cadet. Would you be interested like that? And I went, sure. I love <laughs> photography. I, I, I didn't know how else to get into the industry. So, you know, when you're young and enthusiastic, you just don't say no to things like that. So you know, I stepped into like a four year commitment mm -hmm. and also alongside Leif Ekstrom, who's now the head photographer in that space, which is really nice circle again. Um, mm -hmm. And just having these two amazing, again, more mentors just mm -hmm. show up in my life and spending six years solid in the dark room. I was so fortunate because I love that, uh, particularly the black and white world mm -hmm. in photography and the film. Um, that was just all, you know, even though it was handed to me on, it felt like on a plate, you had, I mean, I had to get through it mm. and you have to commit. And it was, you know, every day in the dark room printing. And then I go to college at night, three nights a week. Mm. Um, you know, and, and, and there was this, uh, you know, I'm going to be honest, it wasn't that easy. Like I, I was never that studious. Mm. So for me, I was like a really hands-on learner and then getting through the assignments and that really thankful for life and Ryder getting me over the line for that. So mm. because it then I then continued into the library world and the space after they opened the, do the darkroom doors up and got <laughs> opportunities upstairs, continued for, you know, duration of 15 years in the library, which mm. was a really nice holistic view on from the production right through to the front line of yeah. meeting and greeting community and inquiries in the in the light I guess we call it <laughs> and, and also helping other people do that journey finding family information resources yeah there's so many um I don't think people realize the the range of roles and um you know, the range of work that we do here at the library. So that must have been amazing helping other people on their family history journeys as well. Yes. Yeah. Um, so I'd just like to remind everyone that um, you're looking, you're watching a curator's talk for 22 decades of Queensland photography. And today we're going behind the lens with Joanne Dreesens, one of the photographers featured in the exhibition. Um, and also reminding you to leave questions, ask questions or leave comments. Um, Joe and I will be here to respond to those. So on to the next question, Joe. One of the photographs that we feature in this exhibition is one that I call iconic for me. Um, it's of the Aboriginal dancers performing during the Walk for Reconciliation back in 2000. It was one of the largest rallies in Queensland's history with an estimated 70,000 people in attendance that day. Can you tell me a bit about that day? Yeah, so I quite often um, look at that photograph too because technically it was the most difficult image I've ever printed 
Mm. One, because I had a very um, wide semi fisheye lens on at the day. It was uh, very, the coldest, one of the coldest day in Brisbane. It was a massive crowd. You know, I, I, for me even, I wasn't expecting that volume of people. Mm. Um, and also starting significantly close to the State Library where I, you know, I actually create a lot of the images inside those walls. So Karelpa Point was the the park, sorry, that where the river bend, that's where the meeting point was. Everyone gathered. Then I noticed that was gonna, it was going to be massive. Mm. And so, you know, placing yourself as a photographer and thankfully those kind of events attract lots of photographers because you just can't cover everything on the day. Mm. I just happened to be, decided to be at the front line with everybody. And that particular image was in front of uh, Roma Street. Mm. So that in between the police station and the bus station, mm. a lot of people, it throws a lot of people out because they're mm. not sure, quite sure where it is. Yeah, and, I, thought, um, I thought it was on Victoria Bridge actually. So that's Yeah, a lot of people think that. Yeah. Um, yeah, I just remember everyone just stopping there. And, there, and like there was also, you know, I have a series of other images where everyone did stop on the bridge as well. And mm. so there were small corroborees and dancing and interactions with people. But um, I also remember the Brisbane Council of Elders at the time and, you know, a lot of them have passed as well. They came across on the, on the bus, mm. you know, because some of them weren't that mobile. Mm. But that particular uh, image was I was literally almost lying on the ground mm. and had enough time to capture that timing of that and then seeing the writing in the sky. So the reason it was technically difficult was because of that, because it is black and white and I had to get the detail in the sorry word in the sky and that was directly in the sun so anyone who does printing will know what I mean so yeah, <laughs> yeah it gave me a hard time that print but it was all worth it. It's an amazing photograph and um, yeah I just uh, it just you couldn't have staged it better yourself you know like it's just so perfectly composed and, and like you say the detail that you've captured in it so thank you for giving the world that that photograph. Um, so I was just going to ask you as well, there was such hope and optimism around reconciliation at that time, I felt, you know, with however many, it was, what, 200,000, 250,000 marching in Sydney and 70,000 in Brisbane and, and in Melbourne, all over the country. Um, so how do you feel about where we're at now as a state or as a country? Yeah, it, it's interesting because I've, you know, I have have been in government for a long time as well and being adopted and I've actually I think about this question a lot just you know every day almost and um, the amount of information that people don't know about the history in this country always shocks me and surprises me and saddens me because I find it so rich and interesting and even though it is difficult parts of it but that's it has to be factual so you can't change history but you can learn from it and you can't move forward unless you learn from it and understand why there are things in place that you know that government put out and people you know make negative comments about it was like well i'm not sure actually how much you know about what's mm. behind that decision mm. so um yeah i think i think there's no excuse too particularly with things so accessible like in situations uh, the internet um, just, you know, general community now taking the lead in their own voices and writing, filming, photographing, singing, um, painting, public art, you know, the amazing work that's there at the State Library and Goman. There's some really important uh, key points of information, you know, whether it's site-specific to that particular area or suburb or state, that there's no reason why people uh, should be ignorant around that information and why it's important to discuss these things. So, yeah. Yeah, I think, uh, yes, I absolutely agree. <laughs> um, so one, one thing I noticed during the research for this exhibition, there were a few gaps in the collection. So we're talking about from the year 2000 onwards. And um, that was the lack of Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander photographers in the collection. There's loads of photos of Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people and community, um, but they were photographed by, mostly by non-Indigenous people. So I'm just um, wondering what your thoughts are on that. Yeah, that is an interesting point. And I know since I've 
you know, left the library and completed my qualification that there's a whole new wave of emerging Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander photographers coming through. Equipment's a lot more accessible. Um, I think the digital world helps with the, the reasoning around that because obviously I know from, you know, when you're in a remote community as such that getting a film process and that would have been a lot of, would have been a bit tedious mm. um, and a big commitment. So even when I met my blood aunties and uncles from Sherberg, they, um, only a few of them had cameras. I don't know my auntie in particular, auntie Sandra Morgan, who works at the Ration Shed, she has this amazing collection of mm. images. She was one of the few in the family um, that, you know, had access to a camera mm. and just loved. And she still does it. Like, so... Um, but in particularly in the arts industry now, I'm to take, uh, specifically working in that space at the moment. Mm. I'm encouraging a lot of those emerging photographers to really understand the benefits and that. So there's, there's, you know, there's two arms you can go. You can be the fine art world, mm. or it can be that archiving documentary process. And mm. quite often, um, I'm I'm referring a lot of inquiries about it for people that might want myself to come and document, but I can't, mm. or I would prefer that if someone would, who is emerging and younger, get that experience. Yeah. So it's really important to have that, that, um, yeah, just that control, that agency in that space. Um, I know now that a lot of projects specifically want, you know, Indigenous photographers for, for lots of different reasons, whether it's cultural, whether it's just, um, again, making that in independent, um, you know, just that control and getting that sort of ownership and, mm. yeah, there's like there's no reason. We've got the skills. We can do it. We can might as well support each other. Yeah. So that was going to be my next question. And you've talked about um, being mentored and having mentors early on in your career. And, uh, and I've noticed a lot of photographers who, you know, worked in this space for a long time they are now mentors. So do you want to tell me a little bit about that? Because I know that you, you are interested in those up and coming photographers. Yeah, absolutely. I think it's um, yeah. highly important, especially in um, even the various areas of the industry, whether it's the arts industry or that collecting in, um, industry, that these skills, all types of skills should be shared. Mm -hmm. And particularly photography, like when I was, going through my career very early on, I just remember people like Tracy Moffat in the fine art space. Um, I didn't know a lot of other uh, Aboriginal art photographers at the time. And then I met uh, Mervyn Bishop mm. during the Queensland Museum time there. So there wasn't a lot and quite often I would also get comments around that. And I didn't really think a lot of it until later on in my life because I was just doing it because I loved it. So I want other people to follow that pursuit and just just enjoy it and just own it and um, just do it really well and always tell them, like I was just speaking to one young photographer yesterday who actually rang me back and said, oh, I'm not really not really into this painting thing. I, I really want to do photography. And I went, yes, that's so good. Yeah. <laughs> I can give you all the time in the world. Let's, let's, let's talk about it. Yeah. 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 It's an important thing, isn't it? Passing on that, that those skills and that knowledge. Um, so we we haven't got m too much time, more time left. But I just wanted to talk about one more thing. So for a long time now, the policy at places like State Library of Queensland, not just us, but many many other collecting institutions, um, around cultural protocols and basically making historical material involving Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander communities not accessible. Um, because we just don't know enough about what is in, in that material, what it contains or where it came from, how it was collected. But that's starting to shift now. So we're starting to take a, the view that we should make these collections accessible, um, take our cues from Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander communities. Um, obviously, there's still protocols around secret and sacred material, uh, which will remain hidden but a lot of other material is going to be made accessible over time. So just wondering, wondering how you felt about that. So I know since the uh, library days when I was there, 
there was a lot of work done that around that and that was particularly also with the uh, impact of the internet mm -hmm. becoming more accessible a lot of people were still understanding what that meant and I know also that there's been a lot of upskilling in Indigenous staff in these specialised fields mm -hmm. so there's uh, there's probably no reason why there, there can't be that communication you have you have the staff the appropriate staff to handle it there's the communication channels. It's just conversations and many, many meetings. Mm. And also with communities, uh, I remember the Indigenous Knowledge Centres were getting set up at the time. Mm. So they're really good points of contact mm. to keep those communication channels going. Yeah. And um, basically I know, you know, we, we have this whole wave of generations coming through at the moment too that are trying to find out a bit more about who they are. So there's probably not a lot of, you know, there shouldn't be restrictions, I'm trying to say, basically, on that because, um, yeah, it's just the conversation. Yeah. It's like it's just like that, you know, the comment we talked around reconciliation and that is yeah. understanding the differences yeah. and having those people come in and assist with that decision-making. Yes, yeah. Joanne, it's been an absolute pleasure to talk to you. Thank you so much for your time. Um, and I would like to encourage everyone to uh, leave comments and, and your feedback um, in relation to this interview. There'll be more interviews in the series um, behind the lens, so stay tuned. And thanks again, Joanne. Thank you so much, Emma, and the State Library of Queensland. Thanks, Joanne.